Now we have time until five, right? Is that the idea? Okay. Uh, so let me actually briefly take another look at the end of the last handout, the Horn Diagrams dot com. Bottom of page six, glimpses of further developments. Um, now this is referring to a, it wasn't a paper at Horn 99, it was um, part of the proceedings paper, okay. Um, in which we see the first uh, signs of inquisitive semantics, which I think he didn't call it that um, at the time. But um, so what's different here? That, so the idea is now we have a question denotation, a nice way of talking about questions in terms of partitions of the logical space. And um, <coughs> now what he wanted to do here was to model the effect that a question has on the common ground or on someone's belief state, something like that. Right? So um, normally in dynamic semantics, I said at the beginning um, today, we talk about information updates, right? the flow of information, uh, you hear some sentence, uh, it is raining, and you eliminate from your belief state all those worlds in which it is not raining, and that way you end up with the belief that it is raining, something like that, right? It's dynamic belief update, and you can have other things like revisions and so on. Uh, now, what is the effect of asking a question if you accept a question into your belief state? That's not the same thing, right? You don't actually learn anything from it. You don't know which answer is true. But at the same time, the question somehow affects what you do next. And so the idea here was to have an update model in which questions or issues stand on a par with normal sentences. Um, so now here. Uh, at the, at the bottom of page six, this is quite the same thing that we had before, only the notation is slightly different because it's taken from this other Hornendike paper. But you can see, so the denotation of a sentence like, now this is, these are double brackets instead of single brackets, but that doesn't need to concern us too much. X, X arrow here is simply a vector, a vector, a string of uh, a, um, um, sequence of variables, x0 through xn. So, at w relative to g, this is now a different way of saying pretty much the same thing, namely what? Uh, worlds v such that, what is the case, for all sequences of individuals Now, I may actually, the, the, this, this may be slightly sloppy. I may have missed um, something, what this n is supposed to be here. Um, it's the length of the sequence here. It, uh, this should have been said somewhere. Now the n is unbound, as it were. But you know, suppose we have a question where we have an n array sequence of variables. Then we look at all possible n array sequences of individuals in the domain of individuals. Um, and uh, so our V ends up in the denotation, uh, in the extension of this question at W, um, if and only if for all possible sequences, the interpretation of the sentence at V relative to an assignment which substitutes these individuals for the value of x is the same as in the rotation of phi relative to w and substitution of the Now, um, it's a little, I mean, you see that uh, it, notationally this is diff it looks different, but it's pretty much the same thing as we had before. Now, we don't have this auxiliary notion which looks at this sets of individuals, but it's 
pretty much the same. So you, you go through all possibility, all possible ways of substituting different values for these variables, right? As assigning different sequences of values to these variables. And if it's if it's always equivalent for all of these possible sequences, then the two worlds end up in the same cell of the partition, which is just to say the two at the two worlds exactly the same individuals make the sentence true and false respectively. Okay. Uh, but here now here that what Rand like at the time he wanted to use this now um, to uh, um, get at the and representation of the state of the discourse, the state of the context that you arrive at after a question has been asked. Now for that we need some, something more. Okay. A context C here is a symmetric and transitive relation on the set of possible worlds. What does that mean? We know, I think, Symmetric and transitive, is that pretty clear? A relation is symmetric, for example, if you cannot have this link. So this is, these are two worlds, and the standard is relationless. You cannot have this without also having that. Right. OK. Uh, and transitive is you cannot have this without also having this. So right inside. Something like this. Uh, yeah. <coughs> so that's what this looks like. And then, so I say here in parentheses, maybe you want it to be reflexive or Euclidean. If it's all that, if it's also Euclidean, then it's an equivalence relation. But let's not worry about that. It's actually, Grant, like at the time at least, didn't think of this as a belief an epistemic accessibility relation or anything like that. He just wanted to, he wanted, he wanted to model the carving of the context space, nothing else. So how does he do it? Uh, okay, there is an absurd context in which the uh, world which is inconsistent. You always want to avoid that. Um, what is more interesting here, also one more thing actually, so symmetry and transitivity they are defined conditionally, right? Symmetry is something like if x, y stand in the relation, then y, x also stand in the relation. Transitivity too has an if clause, uh, but if x, y, and y, z stand in the relation, and x, z also stand in the relation. Uh, so that means, of course, there can be worlds that don't participate in any of this. Um, so this, this doesn't have to cover all the worlds, right? There can be worlds that, that have no arrows. This is, this doesn't violate symmetry or transitivity, right? This doesn't violate symmetry or transitivity. Oh, it's actually, that's not even this. Anyway, uh, so I just wanted to mention it. So the context can actually be a proper subset of the set of all worlds. The context that you're talking about can be a relation which holds somewhere here, you know, it has to be properly connected in the right way, so you get these properties of the relation. But then there can be worlds that are not part of this. So, which is just to say that plain information update eliminating possible worlds from the context that still works. I mean, you don't actually throw them out of the model, but you remove them from this relation. Oops. Uh, uh, okay, now as, as we have a concept. The, the context is some some subset of this. Uh, okay, so here, suppose this is our context. And it is indifferent if it is fully connected. If the relation is fully connected within here, then the context is called indifferent. What does that mean? It's indifferent if you don't want to know anything. You don't have any open questions. You're, you may not know everything, but uh, you don't have any desire to know more than you already do. Something like that. Okay. 
or rather, uh, more in terms of this geometrical picture here, you don't care which, you don't care where you are in the set of worlds. It's not that you would like to know whether you are in, on this end or on that end. You don't care. That's. Now, if you do care, if you would like to know whether you are in this part or in that part, then you want to draw a line and then, you know, gather the information that you need to find out. That's precisely what asking a question comes to. Uh, so you have all these worlds that you consider possible, and asking a question simply means uh, separating your set of possibilities into two or more subsets, which then implies in the way this is set up, that you would like to know, or the next thing you do is try to find out which of the, part the cells in that partition you are in. Uh, so there are these context change potentials, and they are written in this little paper here with an exclamation mark and question mark. So this is, some this is something like an, um, an assertion which makes you update your state. And this is like a question which doesn't actually tell you anything, but adds an issue. Right? Make, um, so, um, and if you update the context with this I exclamation mark, what happens? Well, you end up with another relation between possible worlds uh, it's a subset of C, so you don't add new worlds to your possibilities. Okay, but you you may cut some links. That's the idea. So which links do you keep? These are the links you keep. You keep the ones where the sentence is true. Now. Um, Believe it or not, I actually doubt that I copied this correctly. That the exclamation mark is well, maybe it's it's, it's uh, there's nothing. It's, this handout doesn't contain everything from the paper. So, but this is the proper. This is a proposition. Okay. So um, I think this should be the just this. I mean, I only. I only have this, I, have, I don't have the one with the exclamation. I should have put that on the handout, because I don't remember what it was. Sorry. But, uh, so, I mean, let me not put it there. I'm not, I don't remember. Sorry about that. But, I mean, this is not, this is not uh, so crucial, because we know exactly what the intention is, namely that you keep only links only arrows in your relation which connect worlds at which the sentence is true. So if there are worlds at which the sentence is false, then all links that lead into or out of those worlds are removed. And they, those worlds, like I said, they are still there. They aren't actually, you know, they don't go away, but the relation doesn't capture them anymore. Okay? And the context is defined by this relation. So, this actually shrinks the domain of this relation, the number of worlds that are connected in this way. And if you start out with um, an indifferent context where all the worlds are completely connected, I mean all the worlds in this context that are totally connected, the result is again totally connected and indifferent, but it's on fewer worlds. So, you know, you may have gotten rid of this one, for instance. This is gone, which means all the arrows that relate this world to the others are gone. And this is, this is what's left. So far, so good. That's, that's the usual um, dynamic update. Now, if you update it with the question, the interrogative, um, this is again a subset of the context. So again, a set of 
set of pairs of worlds. And now here we do something different. We don't want to know whether the question, uh, sorry, whether phi has the same truth value, but whether the question has the same answer. Okay. Now what that means is, so the, the question, uh, we don't actually, you know, we don't really throw worlds out. Um, I mean, is the question, question and explanation after the, after the proposition? Yeah, well, I have it on hand out that way. I don't know where it comes. One of these is wrong. I don't know which one. Sorry. Yeah, it's a little sloppy. The, yeah, the question mark, yeah, here it's on the left and there it's on the right. There's something wrong. Sorry. <laughs> we have to go to the salt paper to see. I don't, I don't have that with me. It's not among the ones printed out. So this should be fixed. This has to be fixed. Uh, so the, the, the idea is that so if there are three worlds that are, let's say four, okay? Um, uh, so this is, this is all. I mean, they can also have loops around here. This is not required, but we, if, it's, if it's totally indifferent, actually, then perhaps you want these reflexivity links. Okay. Uh, now, and at each of these worlds, uh, you know, I'll call them A, B, C, D. This has some extension or other. Now the extension of the question is a set of worlds, right? Uh, it's a, yeah. um, and so for example, at world A, the extension of the question may be A, B. Now since it's defined in terms of the, those having the same answer, then at world B it must be at, uh, a, B again. You can't, so this is the problem actually that we pointed out before. It, it's presupposed that um, at all worlds within here the extension has to be the same. I mean if B is in the extension at A, then A is in the extension at B. So Now here we may have something else, you know, uh, now let's just make it simple and say this is D and C and this is also D and C. In that case, you can see immediately which, cut, which links are cut, namely all of these. And so we are left with two separated sets that are still connected amongst each other but no longer across. Okay, these are the links that are kept, if this is the picture. Right. And now if the extension at each of these worlds, uh, let's, uh, let, me, let me say it again. If the intention of the question is a partition, then the extensions cannot overlap. So we cannot have something like a D is say A, B, C can't be, because if A were in here, then D would have to be in the extension at A, and so on. So, that's why you always get these non-overlapping clusters of worlds that are still connected with each other, but no longer across, and they don't overlap in this system. And so the context has not, does, that doesn't have any fewer worlds. The same possibilities are still present. But now this is supposed to represent a state of affairs in which you don't, you are no longer indifferent 
uh, as to which of these worlds you are in. So the the relation here that is symmetric and transitive, this content, this relation that connects the worlds, um, this is not really a relation of ignorance. No, normally, epistemic states that represent what someone knows, they are. I mean, you can think of those as, as in, uh, ignorance, or you, you are unable to distinguish the worlds that stand in the relation. Right, so in an epistemic state, if you have something like this W and V, and you have, you know, they are connected like this, what this is meant to represent is a, is a, a situation where you don't know which of these two is the actual one. Right, so you, both of these are equally possible. Um, now that is ignorance. Here it's indifference. The same kind of thing is. So the same kind of relation doesn't represent the, in, the inability to distinguish between these two worlds, but rather a lack of interest. You don't care which of these worlds you're in. It's an indifference relation. Right? And so if you remove these links, the idea is that you end up with a state of affairs in which you are no longer indifferent as to which of these two clusters you're in. You would like to know. You don't care about C or D. Uh, C, D, right. You don't care about this, but you do want to know whether you're in this or in that. Okay. So that's how this is intuitively interpreted. So this is the 99 uh, picture. And let's not worry about what comes at the very end of the handout. <coughs> there is, there are then certain um, pragmatic notions like this licensing business, uh, whether an answer is licensed by the context. That's, let's not worry about that. Let's move on to this conditional questions paper. Okay. And something that I pointed out at the very beginning in the introduction, let me um, go back to that we saw there, maybe I actually look at it again just to re refresh your memory, this very first handout this morning on, on page four. Um, the semantic problem, and we will only worry about the semantic part of the problem here in this remaining time, is that questions can occur in all kinds of positions embedded in these compounds, along with long imperative sentences uh, and so on, like in 11, if the weather is good, will Joe be hiking? Is a fine question. Okay. And so this is the subject of this paper that we are looking at here. Sentences like that. And there was a lot of interest in sentences like that at the time. And we'll see some contenders for an account of these things. So if we look at the, um, the first example, if Alfonso comes to the party, will Joanna leave? That is another example like that. Okay. Um, now, first of all, we need to ask ourselves what that means intuitively. And of course, the, question, the, the real problem is what counts as an answer to that, and how do we get the, the formal representation to actually predict that that is the answer. And now we have an, an antecedent here, and there are standard stories about conditional sentences with uh, declarative consequence, like if Alfonso comes to the party, Joanna will leave. Um, by no means do we know what, what that really means, but at least there are certain standard assumptions that are made. Uh, uh, you know, and if you want the antecedent to work in pretty much the same way, regardless of whether the consequent is a question or not, then uh, we have to set it up in such a way that we actually get the right prediction for each of these. So, uh, okay, the first guess here might be that conditional questions express conditional speech acts. That is. The question is not actually asked. 
if the antecedent is false. And in order to say exactly what that means, you would actually have to say a bit more about what, the, what, the, what an interrogative, what a questioning speech act really does. And uh, so, well, it's something like a, you know, maybe a request for information. We said this morning that it's not so clear that there is a uniform mapping between question and speech acts and how exactly it's represented. But whatever it is, supposing that say um, you know that there is some request for information on whether Joanna will leave, that is encoded in this interrogative consequent. Then the idea would be that. The, the request for information is not actually in force or in effect unless the antecedent is true. Um, so you wait until you find out whether Alfonso comes to the party or not, and only then does the listener know whether he or she is requested to provide an answer to this sort of uh, how you might tell the story. But now the problem is intuitively that, I think, it's pretty clear, the sentence one actually does demand an answer regardless of whether Alfonso comes to the party or not. And in fact, the speaker does not want to know, or does not want to wait until the facts are in, and doesn't really need to know actually whether the facts are in, uh, whether Alfonso comes to the party or not. The speaker is immediately expecting some kind of answer, right? some information. Now what sort of information is it? This is not the only argument against this conditional speech I think, but it's the most intuitive and I think pretty much the, the best, simplest and best one, that they actually already ask for information, these questions. Not waiting until the antecedent is true or something like that. And uh, so yeah, and then the other the other point is that of course they have fine answers like sentence two, if Alfonso comes, Joanna won't leave, intuitively is an answer to this question. Now if it were a conditional speech act which is not in effect until the antecedent is true, then this conditional sentence would not count as an answer to it already. And at least it's not clear. I mean, maybe you could make it work if you tell a similar story about conditionals that they are conditional assertions, something like that. I don't know. Uh, uh, maybe possible. If you have, if you want to discuss that, we can talk about it. Um, the, the question of is that for conditionals with declarative antecedents, the, the issue is just as tricky. There's a whole bunch of theories that say, uh, who was that who said, that is nice, I think Quine maybe have been the one who said that it's like an envelope you get. And it says, don't open unless the antecedent is true. <laughs> and only then do you know what's inside. Something like that. It's not, there are good arguments against the view that that is what's going on with conditional assertions or, or declarative conditionals. Anyway, whatever. So, um, uh, so maybe you can relate to to one in some some way. But then the other problem is that yes, she will come is also a good answer already, regardless of whether the antecedent is true or false. Yes, she will. It's a good answer, right? Now, is that just an elliptical answer to some sort? of I don't know. Um, it doesn't sound. It doesn't feel like there is no question unless the antecedent is true. There's no questioning speech act unless it's true. So let's at the other. Let's, let's look at the other proposals that really are what people actually are fighting over these days in this area. So there are three proposals that I call semantic, on, starting on page two, in the sense that here we are not talking about speech acts and whether they are in, in effect or not. But uh, they are really about the denotations of these questions, somehow trying to derive the behavior of these things from the, uh, the uh, model theoretic representation. And as I say here in this box, they have all in common, and you'll see that that's the case, 
they always talk about partitioning some set of possible worlds. And all of them do the same thing on the set of possible worlds where the antecedent is true. Namely, they partition it into the consequent worlds and the non-consequent worlds. So, suppose we have if A, then B or not B, right? And we have a, our logical space has the A worlds here and the non-A worlds there, and then we have the B worlds and the non-B worlds. Um, so always, all of these, all of these accounts say that the line is drawn between these two sets, the AB worlds and the A non-B worlds. And they only differ in what happens down here. That's, that's where, the, the, where the fight is going on. Okay. Um, <coughs> and this is, of course, the same way that if you, if you were already in this <coughs> context, this is, that's now um, the way in which, in this context, you would interpret the question whether B on its own, right? Uh, so what do you do with these worlds where the antecedent is false? That's the question. That's, that's the, the problem. Um, okay. Well, one is, as it says here, overlapping alternatives. So this, I'm getting a lot of this from this paper here. Uh, Isaacs and Rawlins. Not all of it, but some of the terminology is there and so on. Um, overlapping alternatives. In the following sense, you have two two answers to the question. Okay. And one of them is this. And the other one is this. Now, this is a little hard to see, so let me draw them side by side. Sorry. That's so funny. Uh, well, okay, let me draw the same space of possible worlds. So here we have the two possible answers. One of them is this set, and the other one is this set. Okay, now this is pretty clear, right? They both include all the non antecedent worlds, but then they differ with regard to what's going on up here. And if you have, if, if and since some of you have read this other paper, this Brandeigen, whatever paper, right? Uh, this is, you see these, right? That's what they do actually in inquisitive semantics. These are the alternatives in conditional questions. Well, that's what it says here too. So questions whose answers are conditionals. Now, this is also good to know or to uh, just be aware of. Um, we have here, for instance, you know, this is, these are the A, B worlds, and then we have non-A. This is the denotation of the material conditional. It, well, let me not use the arrow. Uh, well, I can use the arrow. Well, you see, let me use the horseshoe, yeah. I mean, but that's very unfamiliar. And well, anyway. uh, so this is the material conditional, not A or B. And over here, we have the other material conditional, not A. Or not be. And so these are predicted to be semant semantically correct answers to the question. Now again, we have to distinguish between the semantic answers and the various things you can felicitously say. So there are, there's a looser notion of pragmatic answers, but the, in, the, the things that are in the denotation of the question are these in four. If A, if Alfonso comes, Joanna leaves, or will leave, whatever. And uh, if he comes, then she won't leave. And indeed, we saw that those sentences can actually be used as answers to the question. Yeah, and there are some references here to people who do it this way. Um, the other one, this uh, what is called in this paper tripartition account, but it's only a tripartition if you have a yes-no question and the consequent. It doesn't have to be a yes-no question. You can have something like, if I run into trouble, who should I ask? And then you have as many answers as there are people in your universe. So this can be as fine as it gets. But you have, so for, for n, if your question b has n answers, then your partition has n plus 1 cells. 
And it's already in, in, in guess what the third cell or the, the n plus first cell is. Um, so this is one of your answers. And this is the other one. And then you have a third one for which I don't have a separate color, but you see what I mean. Like, yeah. You have this partition of the logical space, then this can we can put this away. So A B, A not B, and not A. That's a tri partition account. Uh, now here, so the, the answers are as in five. A doesn't come is an answer to the question, and so are these two things. A will come and Joanna will also come. Uh, I won't leave, sorry, leaves. A will come and Joanna will leave. Alfonso will come and Joanna won't leave. These three sentences are the semantic answers to the question. Now, I mean, I don't, I don't really want to move on without pointing out that none of them is intuitively an answer to the question, I think. Or do you agree? I mean, this is just wacky. But let's, let's talk more about that then. Um, <coughs> but there is a the master's thesis out of Amsterdam, this Holstein, who um, collaborates on that. And, well. and then the third one is what's called restricted alternatives, these ones, where now you actually do something almost as, well, just as just as radical as here, here we departed from the partition approach by giving up the mutual exclusiveness of the cells, of the answers, right? They can, here, we, here we allow overlap. Another option is to, um, to allow for non-exhaustive alternatives. That is, the answers are only these two things. And the non-A worlds are not visible even. I mean, they, they, they simply don't enter the picture. They, are, they don't count. They don't count as answers in themselves, and they are not included in any of the answers. That's the third approach. That's what in this paper that I'm talking about right now uh, they, they are trying to argue for. So, John. Joanna will leave and Joanna won't leave. Those are the answers. And then, of course, you have to say something to the effect that, you know, since the conditionals are also good answers, they are somehow um, redundant, perhaps. All right. Now you can see that, yeah, like I said, uh, it really everything here hinges on the question of what becomes of these non-antecedent worlds. Are they an answer? Are they not? And so on and so forth. Uh, so, and unfortunately, it's pretty hard to make good arguments in either direction because and you have to talk here about whether whether it feels like an answer, the difference between so resolving the question and dispelling the question, that sort of thing. It's not easy, but so here are some arguments. Uh, so, well, so if non-A, the, the, uh, that denial of the antecedent, if that is a cell in itself, in the denotation, that is here, right? Then it should feel like an answer. Now, this is a, a, a vague notion, but we don't have anything better. We only have these intuitions, so that it actually feels like an answer. Um, in this following sense, so we have uh, clear cases of answers which resolve issues. Not in the case of, condi uh, of conditionals, but in general. In seven, will Joanna leave? Yes, she will leave. Clearly resolves the question. Uh, which of these books did you read? The blue one clearly resolves the question. Then there is the opposite. Um, clear cases of issue dispelling answers which somehow uh, reject the question or so. 
So uh, has John arrived? John is not coming. That you know, it's questionable whether that's an answer to the question. It's not. It's not an answer. It doesn't resolve the question intuitively. Does Sue regret her mistake? Sue doesn't think it was a mistake. Again, that doesn't answer the question. On the other hand, it, of course, I mean, it sort of makes the question irrelevant. In some sense, it certainly advances the conversation, it makes the value of the contribution, but not by answering the question. So this, these are the kinds of intuitions we have to contend with here. Likewise, in elephant, uh, 11 and 12, so um, in each of these, uh, the answer points out that a presupposition of the question is not satisfied. And therefore, the question is not uh, really in effect or something to that effect. Right? Um, and now for the conditional question, if Alfonso comes to the party, will Joanna leave? The response, Alfonso is not coming to the party. Now here, the, you, know, you have to ask yourself, does that feel like it resolves the question, or does it feel like it rejects the question? So intuitively, at least, and this is what they claim, and I tend to agree, it doesn't resolve the question. It's more like a, like a dispelling rejection response. So the intuition, I think, is pretty clear and widely shared. All right. OK, that's a nice argument, even though it rests on these somewhat ill-defined and sort of um, not very crisp oceans. I think it's pretty clear. Uh, there are other things here. This woman, Elisa Ratu, that's Greek, right? Or, you know? So she, she has this other argument. Uh, if one allows the denial to, well, now she, she just summarizes. Sorry, this just summarizes what the point that I just make. So if we let this be an answer, then it feels like the, Intuitively, we have this strange aspect that the proposition which cancels the reason the question was posed in the first place is an answer. Uh, you have to say a bit more in order to be clear about what she means. Um, you know, uh, why do people ask these conditional questions? Because they want to make contingency plans or something like that, like that right? Uh, they need, to, uh, well, need information that's contingent upon the truth of the antecedent. Um, because they want to apply a modest ponens or whatnot. And then if the antecedent is denied, then none of these reasons for which people chose to ask the conditional question is uh, served by denying the antecedent. I think that's sort of roughly what this quote is uh, comes down to. Um, now another problem arises with affirmation of the antecedent. Um, if 14a, now let's see, 14a, if Alfonso comes to the party, will Joanna leave? Yes, this is our conditional. If it denotes a tripartition, then 14b should count as a partial answer. Alfonso is coming to the party. That's affirmation of the NC. Now that's saying we are in this part of the logical space. Um, now here, yeah, it's, it, I, it, I just say here on the handout, but it is infelicitous. Partial answers are not infelicitous. Partial answers are helpful. This doesn't feel like it takes you any closer to what you wanted out of this exchange. Um, it's yeah. a uh, conditional questions can be used um, for counterfactual. Yeah. This is, there's not much of that on the handout, although there is some of it in the paper. I didn't put that here, but it's true, yes. Now, let me, we can actually um, say a bit about that if you want. Um, so, uh, let me just look at the, there's actually quite a lengthy discussion of that in here, and I skipped that because I didn't want to go through all the arguments. But okay, let's see, so does everyone have a copy of this? I think you do, right? Um, so where is it? Uh, oh, wait. How does this work? I think 
quite understand. Okay. There is something about counterfactual conditional questions on page 280. Right, right, 288, and then uh, subse on subsequent pages as well. Um, I mean, it is a little tricky. Uh, now, actually, I want to I want to look at something later on. Two eighty four, page two eighty four, number twenty five. I mean, no, uh, sorry, uh, twenty seven. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, where are the relevant examples? Uh, maybe 281 is right, I'm sorry. Well, that's where they still discuss Yeah. So, 15 on page 280. If Joe could have fixed the car, would you have kept on using it? That's fine. That's a counterfactual conditional question. Right. And the response, Joe couldn't have fixed the car, is the denial of the antecedent. So here are the points, and let's see, this response, I, I, I didn't put this on the handout because I find these judgments even, or these distinctions even more subtle, and, and I'm not so sure what exactly to think about this. When they say, intuitively the response does not dispel the issue and even seems somewhat infelicitous. And in my mind, a, a denial of a presupposition is also somewhat infelicitous. Well, I mean, it's not... It's not very smooth on its own, right? If you have, uh, if Alfonso comes to the party, will Joanna leave? Alfonso isn't coming to the party. It's not infelicitous, but it's not an answer either. Now, what's the difference between that and being somewhat infelicitous and without dispelling the issue? I don't know. Um, I mean, it's, so the, the thing is, so the intuition is that in this case, if you answer it, Alfonso isn't coming to the party, what you're really saying is um, the question is moot. The que it's it's uh, irrelevant or something like that. Okay, let's let's forget about that question. Now, and they claim here for the counterfactual that something like Joe couldn't have fixed the car doesn't do the same thing. The question somehow hasn't been addressed at all. That 15b is simply uh, changing the topic. Maybe, I don't know if that's the right way to put it, but something like that. I mean, it's, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't actually see that difference. That's why I didn't put this on the handout. I think maybe if you have BB, there's no way Joe could fix the car. Yeah. So why bother? But then you could say here, if, well, Alfonso isn't coming, so why worry about that? I don't see the difference between that and I mean, what, this, what the, the responder actually does by denying the antecedent is very similar. I think it's very similar. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the only thing is, you really, for a counterfactual, you really need to be more emphatic in, in uh, yeah. be, Because, of course, with counterfactuals, you've got to always consider the possibility, right? Right, right. Oh, yeah. And then, there, of course, there's this thing that the counterfactual already suggests, I don't want to say presupposes, but suggests that the antecedent is false. And so the denial of the antecedent, uh, what do you say, Re reaffirms what the counterfactual already implied in some way. And that's also why it's worse than in the indicative case, where at least I think it's possible that it's true, antecedent. Yeah, so maybe this other one is better in 16. If Joe could have fixed the car, would he have kept on using it? Joe could have fixed the car. No, I don't know. I mean, this is just as weird. I'd, I'd say if there is time at the end, we can worry more about these counterfactual kind of issues. I don't actually see very different arguments coming out of that kind of data. That's why I didn't put them on it. But if you use that, no. As touch is like if um, like if I I know we we all know that if 
we all know that Alfonso didn't come to the party, but if he did, if Alfonso had come to the party, uh, would Joanna have left? Yeah. Something like that. Do you know that? Um, all right. That the is, uh, false. Oh, you already know that it's false, yeah. and you still can and use it. Yeah. Yes, that, that makes a difference, although um, you would, I think you would actually want to say that, um, I mean, in bringing this up as a possible argument, you're actually implying that it's infelicitous to ask a question if some of his answers are already ruled out. That's generally not the case, actually. It's, it, you know, you can have you can ask a question, um, even you know, say which has eight cells in the partition, even if you already know that four of them are ruled out. So that's that's why I'm a little I'm not I'm not sure about that. So here you can just say, okay, we know that this isn't the case, but why can't you ask the question still? Well, you wouldn't phrase it as a conditional. That's why the question may be odd. Uh, but not because this is already rolled out. I'm not sure. I mean, am I making sense? I'm not sure. I'd like uh, let's 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 move on. Then. Oh, sorry, this is different handout. Where the oh here. Um, partial and total answers, this is also, uh, uh, yeah, let's see what this says. Um, conditional sentences like 15b prime. Yes, if Alfonso comes, Joanna will leave. Are complete answers to the question, just like 15b. Yes, do you agree? I think that's pretty clear. I mean, uh, there's, there is, I mean, the intuition here is that after hearing that, you don't you don't need to need to know any more new information in addition to that. So it's complete and the result completely resolves the, the issue. Um, however, all three of these cells in the triple partition are um, proper subsets of this denotation of the conditional. Therefore the conditional should be intuitively a partial answer only. I mean, you know, the thing is that the intuition is that if this is what the question you know is, then you actually want to know which of these three cells you're in. Now, if someone gives you a conditional, if A and B, you still don't know, I mean, you, you can rule out this one, but you still don't know which of these two cells you're in. So you should still feel unsatisfied with the response. The question hasn't been resolved. That's not intuitively what goes on. And moreover, if you need speed double prime there, I guess Alfonso will come and Joanna will leave. That feels like an over-informative answer to the question. That's more than what you wanted to know. I mean, it's not wrong to say such a thing, but it's, it, it supplies additional information. Well, then that would mean that this cell, which is the denotation of the sentence, is a proper subset of one of the answers. So all of these arguments, while they speak partly in favor of this overlapping approach, and on the other hand, uh, this approach, which simply dismisses the non antecedent worlds, can also make sense of them in, the sense, in a way which you'll see uh, how that is implemented. Um, and in fact, it'll turn out that we we can't really. I mean, we, we can we can get rid of. I think there are good arguments against this n plus one cell um, theory. But it's really hard to argue between these two. That's, that's pretty hard to come to a conclusive opinion as to which is right for those. 
Okay, let's just briefly go over how they do it because we need to be done by five. Um, and so I will only say a few things. Yeah, there's actually not much on the handout. I already expected this. Um, how this works. So um, Isaacs and Rawlins want to make an account work which has this uh, ignoring property. That is, you have these two answers to the question. These are your answers and they do not exhaust all the possibilities. Okay. Well, how do you do that? So, um, well, a context is still a set of possible worlds, just as usual. It's not, um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, let's just say a set of no is an equivalence relation on a set of possible worlds. Sorry, it's the same as on the hand of an equivalence relation. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, and raising an issue is. It uh, works in just the same way that we saw before with the Frenendijk uh, picture where you cut links across different equivalence classes. Okay. Um, so, okay, uh, given a discourse situation is characterized by two things, namely the set of worlds that are actually in the context set. Those are the ones consistent with those mutual joint beliefs. Um, and then the issue is raised in the context. This, this is, these are the things that cut across these different occurrence classes. And there are two kinds of update, an assertive update and an inquisitive update. The assertive update operates the way you would expect. You can also, so there are the formal definitions in the paper and references to them, but maybe we don't need to look at them. It's up to you, tell me um, if you want to go in more detail. but. Uh, so if you are given a sentence phi, which is not a question, just a, a declarative sentence, um, then you remove the worlds at which it's false from the domain of this equivalence relation. That is, so, um, you know, again, if you have a total set of all worlds and no issues are raised at the moment, then we have an equivalence relation somewhere here um, that relates a, a cluster of worlds to each other. So there are worlds, they say there are some number of worlds that are completely connected amongst each other. And then there are worlds out here that have no arrows coming in or going out or anything like that. Now, um, an assertive update simply adds more to these unconnected worlds by eliminating, in eliminating links. Not worlds, but links. So we may end up with this lying out there all by its own, right? So we just, that's, that's how we gain information by throwing out these links. And then we have the inquisitive update with an issue. An issue is also an equivalence relation, um, or at least can be modeled that way. And uh, in this case, we don't end up with worlds that are isolated from the rest, but we do end up with a picture where we draw these, these gaps between the worlds. So, okay, as before. No new information is added, rather new issues are raised, or open issues are refined. So you, you're fiddling with the discourse planning. There's an example in the text which uh, we can look at if there's time at the end. It's also interesting, uh, it's so well explained that uh, it's really a, actually fun to look at. So do it on your own time, perhaps, if you're interested. There are pictures in there that show how the context changes in response to various kinds of updates. And I have the reference here on page 273. Well. I won't go into it now. Um, okay. So, now how do we, this, this still has nothing to say about how these 
how this picture comes about, uh, what, um, how an update with a conditional question leads to the right notion here. Okay, to see how that works, we need this more extended notion of a context. Now, we have two things here, a context, notion of a context and notion of a macro context. What is a macro context? It's a list of contexts. So, this set of worlds that is in the context set, let's uh, draw it as um, like this. And now there may be more contexts lined up in this macro context. Now the whole discourse situation is described by an object like this, where only one of these things models the actual beliefs that people have, and the others are hypothetical contexts. In what sense hypothetical? Well, for instance, well, you know, uh, at the very bottom of page six, you have these cases of modal subordination, for, uh, which is, um, you know, 16, those are standard examples. A thief might come in, he would take the silver. These are two separate sentences. And now what's, what's uh, special about these is that, first of all, the he in the second sentence has no trouble finding an antecedent, even though the thief was introduced in a moral context. And uh, so the, uh, the thief should not be readily accessible uh, to the pronoun. But it is. So why is that? Well, because somehow in, the, in processing this first sentence, a thief might come in, we have remembered that we are talking about the situation in which a thief comes in. But obviously we have not actually updated our beliefs with the information that the thief comes in because that's not asserted. However, it's sort of the topic of the conversation is still what happens if a thief comes in. That's what subsequent sentences are about. At least if they have things like wood in them as in 16b. And so he would take the silver is not um, processed uh, on its own as a standalone sentence, but it ends up being something semantically uh, like well, the information is conveyed is really if a thief comes in, he will or would, I'm not sure, well, let's not worry about the, the mood of the mortal, take the silver. So um, in order to get this to work, we need, or we, we we can avail ourselves of some kind of mechanism to keep track of these temporary contexts we are talking about but not really um, taking as factual information. That's what these stack models are meant to um, represent. So that you know you start out with some uh, epistemic state and then you say a thief might come in, might come in. And so, um, somehow, let's not worry about details. You end up with something like this, which... Um, where up here you have this context derived from the actual one, because there is no counterfactuality involved in any of these. Derived from the, fact, uh, from the actual one in which a thief comes in, that's what you're talking about, right? And then you are learning things about this context in that actual context. In one epistemic state, you learn something about another state. Namely, that if the other state has this property that it supports the sentence that the thief comes in, and it also has this other property that the thief takes the silver. Now this is somehow relevant and affects the actual context. Because it, you throw out worlds in which a thief comes in and doesn't take the silver. So that's what these snake models were introduced to deal with. Uh, 17 is another example for conditional, something very similar happens. If, uh, if John bought the book, he'll be reading it by now. 
it'll be a murder mystery where again the uh, it has no trouble finding an antecedent, namely the book. And moreover, sentence B is interpreted as adding another condi conditional to the, um, the, com the com common ground. Um, and so, yeah, and uh, so in 17C you see that there must be some, some mood matching between them. So it's a murder mystery, it doesn't work as well. So that's the basic idea and the motivation for this, and there's more to be said about these. Uh, but let's just see how it works in this case for conditional questions. Can I ask you something? Yeah. Uh, so um, when you have... Oh, I just erased it. So it might not matter for what they are assuming, but so when you um, update what you start out with, which is the bottom one, mm -hmm. where the thief might come in. The only thing that you do, well, you check for consistency. Yeah. And, if, and then you keep the context as it is and just add, the, right. so the, 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 what did you call it, the head to the stack? The, 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 the top or the whatever. Top, yeah. 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 So. And then when you, so at that point, you haven't eliminated anything. Either you've reached the empty set or you keep what you have, you just... Oh, yeah, this. so yes, you, is that, that is still like a test. So that's yeah. an actual, okay. yeah. I mean, it, this, this in itself doesn't so solve that, the openness of, of that. That's, it's a test. And right. then when you're updating with, uh, he would take the silver. Right. Then you can eliminate worlds even in the bottom. Yeah, okay, so, so the idea here is, and this is, I mean, there's, there's no more elegant, unfortunately, no more elegant solution, although there are several alternatives to this. All of them have to stipulate something about what happens in the bottom context. Mm -hmm. uh, so first of all here, to take this apart a bit more, uh, you um, make an identical copy of this bottom context, and then you, mm, uh, this is something that, well, you update the top with the information that phi throw out the non phi worlds from the top. So you don't actually learn that phi is true, but you assume that it is true. And then, yeah, right, so that the, what, what, what the model then does is it checks whether this is consistent with that. Right. With conditionals, something else happens, so let's actually do this. this, is, this the thing here is this gives you a a representation for an update with this, if phi. That alone, so there's not, you don't need to know the actual, the entire conditional. So if phi has this effect, it pushes a new state on the stack and makes it a phi state by throwing out the other stuff. And now here can, you can also see, so if, if then, if you update an ordinary, a single stack with psi, this is simply, so these are the side worlds, whatever. Um, this part, okay, you just eliminate stuff. And you always do precisely this kind of update to the top element of the stack. If the top element is the actual state, then, well, that's what happens. If the top element is one of these things, um, so there are also side worlds in here, then, first of all, well, you only really um, well, um, I don't like this, but um, you end up with this. You have cut out the non side worlds from the top element. Now, what needs to be stipulated is that that somehow affects the so actual. The, the yeah. other one. Yeah. And there is a percolation thing. So, so it, in principle, this can apply recursively, and you can add more things to the top. And you always only operate on the top element, but whatever affects that trickles down as conditional information to here. Yeah. Wouldn't it help to to disentangle the, the stack by um, by introducing some kind of I mean the long Stonecker's line some kind of proposition attitude which says that phi is has been supposed. And that's then has been supposed in the actual world. Yeah, well, that is sort of what this is supposed to... Yeah, but then, then that, that statement in itself would depend on the actual world. I don't know. It's just... 
I have to think about that. Yeah. 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 Anyway, yeah, so that's what, that's what, what happens with these. Now, if you have a conditional question, then you also go up to, the, up to this part. But then, now, uh, you know, there's, the, the, the second thing is not psi, but the question was it psi. So you don't dismiss anything from this top element either, but you carve it up. You raise an issue in this hypothetical state. And now the, the definitions in the paper are very detailed and tell you what exactly happens as a result down here and how answering this question gets you factual information in your actual state. But we don't, perhaps, I'm not sure, we don't really need to go there in great detail. That's the idea anyway. And now let's uh, think about this from the perspective of you know, the question about uh, what is the uh, state of uh, the, the denotation of this? Well, you never actually apply the question to this state. That's that's the idea. So, uh, well, there isn't actually a conditional sentence that is applied. There are these two steps. The if clause does one thing, and it always does this, regardless of whether the consequent is a question or not. And then the consequent does something different, uh, depending on whether it's a question or not. But uh, if it is a question, it only operates on the antecedent worlds. It only sees those. It, 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 the context it gets to operate on is already reduced to the antecedent worlds. Uh, so this is this is interesting. Well, it's sort of it's a kind of maybe something like a hybrid between this approach and the overlapping alternatives because what you ultimately end up with in this thing down here um, if you answer the question say you know if the answer is yes you actually end up with the entire set here this one of these uh, alternatives from the overlapping account that's what remains in the context set after all is said and done. So you have avoided a decision on whether the, what, what, what this, you, you, have, you have hidden the non-antecedent worlds from this interrogative consequent. But the result, so th therefore, uh, there's never any, you don't actually have to solve, the, you don't face the problem what to do with these worlds. But ultimately, the information you end up with after your conditional question is answered is one of these alternatives from the overlapping approach. OK. So one more thing. Now let's, let's go to Renendag and Rolofsen. Um, there is more about this paper uh, to be said about this paper, but that's OK. So there is a short handout about that, which only mentions the crucial things. And that's pretty good, because we have exactly enough time for that. I think it's almost ideal. Inquisitive semantics. So it's, I start here with a disclaimer sort of sorts, saying that, well, there is so much to inquisitive semantics, and so much more than we can talk about here. It's very ambitious. It also has to do with pragmatics, so on, and so on. It's a dialogue steering business. But I'm mostly interested now in what it does with conditional questions. And let's only talk about that, because that's what we have time for in 20 minutes. But the first thing we need to know is that um, this junction is really the, the sort of the hinge on which everything else hangs in this theory. In fact, in this theory, in this account, uh, questions have the same kind of denotations as disjunctions. They are the same, semantically the same thing in a sense. Um, and now there are these figures in the paper that we should look at because I cannot draw figures that are as beautiful as these. And everyone should enjoy them. 
on page three. There are really two ways of interpreting a disjunction. So what do these figures mean here, really? Um, this, is, this is intended to be for a sentence like P or Q. Okay. And the idea here is we have these numbers, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, and 0, 0. These are the assignments of truth values to the two sentences, P and Q, respectively. This, uh, you're looking for the paper? Um, everyone should have one. Oh, you have it. OK. Yeah. Um, OK, now, so let's see. We have 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. And there are these two alternatives, one corresponding to P, another one corresponding to Q. And then this, doesn't, this isn't part of any of these alternatives, the, the case where both are false. Um, OK, now this is supposed to be the denotation of this um, of this sentence. You can also get at the traditional classical interpretation of the disjunction, which is on the left-hand side in the figure, where um, just all, all three of these are in one alternative. So now this, it, I'm putting this or here because it's sort of pre-theoretical. Pre they have different expressions that correspond to these two things. So here we have these three in one um, in one alternative. Technically, this is what they take to be the denotation of this expression that the or does this. It it um, gives you the two possibilities and lets you keep track of them separately. And they are not the first to do that. In fact. Someone in this room has said a lot about this. Uh, this is uh, so. There, I mean, there is a lot of a lot to be said about this approach because intuitively, in language, you often want to keep track of the two alternatives that are raised by a disjunction. This happens, for example, with disjunctive antecedents in a uh, sorry disjunctive if A or B. Yeah, disjunctive antecedents in the conditional if A or B then C. Intuitively, that's equivalent to if A then C and if B then C. I don't know if I have that somewhere on the handout. Um, in cl classically, that doesn't follow. But in, if you can actually keep track of how, you, how these alternatives were introduced with the disjunction, all of this can be solved quite beautifully. Uh, here, they have uh, likewise for this, uh, this expression, but they have an operator which flattens the alternatives and gives you just a union of them. And that's how you get the classical denotation out of the inquisitive denotation. Okay. Now this is, this is called an inquisitive um, denotation. So this sentence is inquisitive because it has more than one alternative. And generally the idea is that you would like to know which of them is true. That's what an inquisitive sentence does to the context. Um, it is also informative because it eliminates one possibility. They call these sentences that do both hybrids, hybrid sentences. Questions are generally not hybrid. They only introduce uh, alternatives. But disjunctions can be because it rules out one possibility and raises an issue about the rest. Now, see, that the, issue, the two alternatives are not disjoint. So this jointness, mutual exclusiveness, is gone in this picture. We are not talking about partitions anymore for questions either. All right, so the, the thing that, oh, let me actually put it back to the handout. Uh, oh, here are some problems that are ultimately fixed, uh, even though we don't want to go there, actually. So Elf will go to the party, or Bia will go uh, for in, in one, if this is already known, if this has been asserted, the, the disjunction, then the question in 1b becomes redundant. 
And uh, so it does nothing intuitively to the context anymore. Which is a little odd because if the disjunction had simply changed the context to this, the set containing these three alternatives, then the question should still be able to raise an issue about this, to affect it somehow, namely to you know, ask, are we here or are we here? So, that, but, so the claim is that 1B is redundant in this very strong sense that it doesn't even raise a new issue that wasn't already raised in the context. Uh, disjunctive antecedents, there's actually one here. If alpha or beta comes, we will have fun. It's intuitively equivalent to B. If alpha comes, we will have fun. And if beta comes, we will have fun. Uh, classically, under any uh, sort of straightforward the kind of conditionals, whether it's truth functional or somehow strict conditional or whatever, this isn't valid. But now we'll see that this actually falls out immediately from this account. We don't have to do anything to make this come out. Uh, or we only have to define the conditional, right? the if-then construction. Likewise, disjunctive consequence, if Alf comes, he will bring beer or wine. Uh, this is intuitively equivalent to a disjunction of conditionals. If Alf comes, he will bring beer. Or if he comes, he will bring wine. Bring wine. That also is classically not valid but intuitively it should be, and it will fall out immediately. Questions are the same, like I said, the same kind of thing as disjunctions. In fact, yes, no questions whether P are introduced with this operator node. Right now, at least in this version, as discussed in the paper that I have here, there is no first order stuff going on. And the the only questions that are being discussed there are yes, no questions. So, well, it's, um, uh, but there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, you can, it's a, this, this, these are the only questions that are actually introduced by something like this operator. But you can multiply the alternatives by various operations. But this is actually defined in terms of the disjunction. It's P or not P. That's what this question P, question mark P does. Okay. Um, all right, uh, so now f let's see. I want to get to the point where you can see how the what actually conditional questions denote in this, in this model. Let's see what the model looks like. Uh, so we have indices and now under apparatus. An index is something like a possible world. It's these things here. If you only have two sentences, then these are our four indices we are talking about. And then there is a, a notion of a state, which is a set of indices, non-empty. Okay. Uh, so we actually have two states here in this denotation of P or Q, for instance. This is one state. Um, okay, now the notion of support is important. State sigma supports sentence phi, if and only if, blah, 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 and then there are definitions on page six. We will have to say something about those definitions um, ultimately. Right now, what I'd like to point out about these, if you could, and if you could look to, to page six of the paper, definition one. Um, well, for a simple atomic sentence, P, sigma supports P if and only if all the indices in sigma support P. That is very unsurprising. Uh, negation is not so obvious. You have two options here, and they choose a strong version of negation, namely no possible refinement of sigma supports sentence. Okay, so that is a pretty strong notion, namely, not only do you not know that, not, not only does sigma not carry the information that phi is true, uh, it's actually impossible to get it to 
if I read that information. There's there's no corner in sigma in which phi is true, right? It's false throughout phi. Um, disjunction, well, we have also a strong notion of disjunction. Sigma supports this disjunction if and only if it either supports one or it supports the other. So if sigma is a mix of some phi indices and some psi indices, then it doesn't support the disjunction phi or psi. It does support this thing here, this, this classical, the, uh, what they call the informative closure of the sentence. And then finally, the conditional, if phi and psi, is supported by sigma if and only if um, all subsets of sigma which support phi also support psi. That's something we have to get back to uh, in a minute. Uh, if you are into intuition, into into, if you are familiar with intuitionistic logic, you will see that I mean, you see immediately that this is actually quite um, straightforwardly coming from there. That is, you know, all possible ways in which you might learn that phi is true will inevitably get you to also learn that psi is true. It's basically what this says. If you think of learning something as, you know ending up in a subset of your current state. Uh, Alright, so how does the treatment, the right treatment of questions follow from that? There's one more thing that we need here, a possibility, it's, uh, they call it possibility a set of worlds, so actually a state can be a possibility. A proposition though is a set of states, a set of possibilities. So a proposition is no longer a set of possible worlds. This is important to keep straight in the system. It's not the case. A proposition, this is actually a proposition, for instance, here. Okay. It's a set of possibilities. What's, what's the possibility for, for a sentence? Well, it says on the previous page, it's a maximal state supporting that sentence. So that is, in this particular setup here, for instance, here, this thing also, if you just look at this, this is a state, the singleton set containing one zero. It supports this disjunction because it supports one of the disjuncts, namely Q, uh, no P, I guess, P, Q, uh, one, of the, one of these. Uh, so it's a state that supports this disjunction, but it's not a possibility for the sentence because there is a, a larger state which includes it and also supports the disjunction. So that's that's what this. Uh, that's why this is a possibility and this is not. So we don't keep all of these things down at the bottom with us. Only the maximal ones. You'll see why that is actually. What 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 the consequences of that are for conditionals. So I want. This is, I, look at this. Eight more minutes. I want to go through the three propositions denoted by these three sentences. Okay, re remember propositions are actually a uh, set of states, not set of worlds. First of all, just the conditional itself. If P, then Q, and uh, so suppose we have these four things here again, on one, one, zero, zero, one, zero, zero. So, um, if we look at the definition for this arrow, for the conditional operator, um, now a state, a set of, any set of possibilities taken from here, any, any set, subset of this, will support the conditional if P and Q, if and only if all subsets of it, which support phi, the antecedent, P in this case, also support Q. Okay. Now let's first look at four states which have this property that if uh, that they uh, if they support P, they also support Q. That's true of this thing, for instance. It supports P and also uh, also supports Q, right? So it is it is one of the subsets of our state which verify 
this. Now the same is true of this state. If this supports P, it also supports Q, right? And likewise here. If this supports P, it also supports Q. This one doesn't. Now these are three states which, of which this, this condition is true. Okay. Uh, now we are looking for maximal states of which it is true. Now obviously it's also true of this state. What condition that uh, for all subsets of this state, for all substates of it, if they support P, they support Q. But it's still not maximal. This is a maximal state with this property that for all substates of it, if they support P, they also support Q. I mean, there are some more. There's, for example, this one here and this one here. All of these have this property. This is a maximal state for the conditional. So it is a possibility. Actually, it is the only one for this because this sentence is not inquisitive. I mean, it's, a, it's the other way around. It's not inquisitive because there is only one possibility for it. That's, what, that's how the conditional comes to denote this. What about the conditional with the in interrogative consequent? Slightly different then. Um, if P then question mark Q, and again we have 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. Remember what it meant for a stage to support a question. Well, we have to actually perhaps refresh our memories that this part here alone, this was really Q or not Q. That's how this was defined, right? Now remember what it means for a state to support this. Either it supports Q or it supports not Q. Now Q is the second number here. For example, this state does not support P or not Q. Because, uh, sorry, Q does not support Q or not Q. Because Q is true here and false there, so um, neither of the disjuncts is supported by it. And so it, it, it's not part of it. However, this one, for instance, supports Q or not Q. And so does, sorry, this one, but also this one, right? Q or not Q. Okay, that's good, but we're not done. I mean, we're actually looking for the conditional. If P, then Q or not Q. Now, we have to look for states which support P and then ask, of those, whether they also support Q or not Q. So let me get rid of these pink circles there, so possibly misleading. So what are the states that support P? Uh, 1, 1, 0, 1, sorry. Uh, so P, well, P is true here, for instance, right? This is a state that supports P. This is also a state that supports P, and so on. Okay, this doesn't, and this doesn't. All right, now, um, for this, let, let's look at the this, this small one. Is it true of the small state that if it supports P, it supports Q or not Q? Yes, right? It is. Looking at the bigger one, is it true of the bigger one that if it supports P, it supports P or not Q. Uh, Q on a sorry. No, it's not, don't not, because it's not the case. Because it does support P, but it doesn't support Q or not Q. So this is not a state in which uh, the conditional is supported. Okay. However, this is because, yeah, this again, it supports P and also Q or not Q. Likewise, for these two, 
vacuously, right? It's true of this that if it supports P, it also supports Q and Q. And here. Now these two together, lumped together, also form a state such that if it supports P, it supports Q and Q. Okay, now maybe we can already see where this is going. Um, we have these states uh, of which we already know that they, su that they support the conditional. Now uh, the question we just ask is, are they maximal? Uh, sorry, not, not are they maximal, yeah, no. Are they maximal states with the following property all of the, their substates are ones with this which support with, uh, such that if they support P, then they support Q or not Q. And it's a little tricky. We actually have to look at larger ones. These aren't maximal yet. We have to look at this guy, for instance. Now, first, let's ask about this state. Is it true that if it supports P, then it supports Q or not Q? Yes, because it doesn't support P, right? Likewise for the other one, which I will now draw over here. 